Welcome to NHK World's Listening Library. I'm Yuka Aotani. Today's story, Cherry Leaves and the Whistler, is by Osamu Dazai. Born to a wealthy family in 1909, he's famous for his bohemian lifestyle and his profoundly pessimistic novels. Dazai was obsessed by suicide and sadly drowned himself with his lover just before his 39th birthday. Today's story, like many, reflecting his own experiences, is written in first person. Here is Cherry Leaves and the Whistler, translated by Ralph F. McCarthy. When the blossoms have scattered and the cherry trees are full of leaves like this, I always remember that time. It was 35 years ago, father was still alive, and our family, if you can call it that, for there were only three of us, father and my younger sister and I, mother having passed away some seven years earlier, when I was 13. Our family was living on the outskirts of a castle town in Shimane Prefecture, a place near the Japan Sea with a population of twenty-some thousand. Father had accepted a post as headmaster of a middle school there when I was eighteen and my sister was sixteen. But since no suitable lodgings were available in town, we rented two rooms in a detached house on the grounds of a temple near the foot of the mountains. A house we were to live in for six years until father was transferred to a middle school in Matsue. I didn't marry until after we moved to Matsue in the autumn of my twenty-fourth year, which in those days was quite late for a girl. Had my sister been healthy, I would have felt somewhat more free to do as I pleased. But though she, quite unlike myself, was a beautiful and very intelligent child, with long, lovely hair. She was physically infirm, and in the spring of the second year after father took their job in the castle town, when she was eighteen and I was twenty, she died. This is the story of something that happened shortly before her death. She'd been in a very bad way for quite some time by then. She had renal tuberculosis. The doctor had told father, in no uncertain terms, that the end would come within a hundred days. He said there was nothing he could do. There was nothing we could do either, of course, but watch in silence as a month passed, another month passed, and even as the hundredth day approached, my sister, not knowing how close to death she was, remained in relatively good spirits. And though she was confined to bed day and night, she cheerfully sang songs and joked and let me spoil her. And whenever I reflected that she had only 30 or 40 days to live, that this was absolutely certain. It was as if my entire body was being pierced by needles, and I thought I would go mad with the pain. March, April, May. Yes, it was the middle of May. I'll never forget that day. My sister called to me when I got home. She was by now terribly thin and weak and she seemed to be becoming vaguely aware that she didn't have long to live. She no longer asked me to cater to her whims, to mother and spoil her, and that was only making it all the more painful for me. When did this letter come? she said. The question gave me such a start, so pierced my soul, that I felt the blood drain from my face. When did it come? She asked again, all innocence. I pulled myself together and said, 
Just a while ago, while you were sleeping, you were smiling in your sleep. I put it there by your pillow. You didn't notice, did you? No, I didn't. Darkness was falling, and her smile was pale and beautiful in the dim light of the room. I read the letter, though. It's so odd. I don't know this person. Oh, you don't, don't you? I thought. I knew who the sender was. A man named M.T. Oh, I knew who he was all right. No, I'd never met him. But five or six days before this, I'd been arranging the things in my sister's wardrobe when I came across a bundle of letters tied with a green ribbon and hidden in the bottom of one of the drawers. It wasn't the right thing to do, I suppose. But I untied the ribbon and looked at the letters. There were about thirty of them, and they were all from this Mr. M.T. Mind you, his name wasn't written on the envelopes, but all the letters were signed by him. On the envelopes were the names of various girls, all of whom are actual friends of my sister's. Father and I never dreamed that she was carrying on such voluminous correspondence with a man. No doubt this M.T. was a cautious fellow and had asked my sister the names of a number of her friends so that he could write her without arousing suspicion. Having deduced that much, I marvelled to myself at the boldness of youth, and it was enough to make me shudder with fear just to imagine what would happen if our stern and severe father were to find out. But as I read the letters in the order in which they'd been sent... I began to feel rather giddy in spite of myself, even laughing out loud from time to time at the childlike innocence of the words. It was as if a vast new world were opening for me. I read through the pile of thirty-odd letters with all the urgency of a stream rushing down a mountain slope. But when I began the final letter, which had been written the previous fall, I suddenly leapt to my feet. The sensation was, perhaps, like being struck by lightning. I stood bolt upright with a shock. My sister's romance had not been purely platonic. It had progressed to more detestable things. I burnt the letters, every single one. M.T. was, as far as I could gather, an impoverished poet who lived in the town and enough of a coward to have abandoned my sister as soon as he learned of her illness. The cruelest things were written in the final letter and in the most offhand, breezy way how he and she should try to forget each other and so on. And since then, apparently, he hadn't written again. It occurred to me that if I simply kept to myself what I'd just discovered, my sister could remain to the end, a pure and unsullied young maiden. No one knows, I told myself, and this heart alone shall bear the torment. But learning the truth only made me pity my sister even more. I imagined all sorts of outrageous things, and I myself felt a bittersweet sort of ache in my heart, a suffocating horrible kind of feeling that no one but a girl coming of age can ever understand. It was a living hell, and I suffered it alone, as if it were I who'd had that dreadful experience. I was really not quite myself in those days, you see. Read it, won't you? my sister said. I haven't the slightest idea what it's all about. Her dishonesty at that moment was thoroughly repellent to me. Are you sure it's all right? I asked quietly, my fingers shaking in a most discomforting manner as I took the letter. I knew what it said without opening and reading it, but I had to pretend otherwise. I read it aloud, scarcely looking at the pages. 
Today, I must ask your forgiveness. My lack of self-confidence is all that has kept me from writing sooner. I am a poor and incompetent man. There is nothing I can do to help you. All I have to give you are words. My words contain not the slightest shadow of falsehood, but they are, nonetheless, only words. I began to hate myself for my powerlessness, my inability to offer you anything more as evidence of my love for you. I haven't forgotten you for a single moment, not even in my dreams. But I can do nothing for you. It was the pain of this realization that made me decide we must part. The greater your misfortune and the deeper my love for you, the more difficult it is for me to approach you. Can you understand that? You mustn't think I'm merely making excuses. I believed I was doing the right thing, but I was mistaken. I know now that I was wrong. Forgive me. I only wanted, in my selfishness, to be the ideal man for you. I will not run from you again. I love you. Each and every day, I shall write you a poem and send it to you. And this too. Each and every day, I shall stand outside your garden fence and whistle. I'll be there tomorrow evening at six o'clock, whistling the battleship march. I'm a good whistler, you know. This much, at least, I can do for you without difficulty. You mustn't laugh at me. No, on second thought, please do. Be happy. God is somewhere, surely, watching over us. I believe that. You and I are both his children. We are certain to have a lovely marriage. I waited and waited to see them in blossom, this year's peaches. I'd heard they were white. These flowers are crimson. My studies are going well. Everything is fine. Until tomorrow, M.T. I know what you did, my sister said in a clear, soft voice. Thank you. You wrote this letter, didn't you? I was so ashamed. I felt like tearing my hair and ripping the letter into a thousand pieces. Distraught. I guess that's the word. I had written the letter. I just couldn't bear to see my sister suffer like that. And I intended to write a letter every day, imitating M.T.'s handwriting, and to include in each one a painstakingly poor attempt at a whack of poem. And yes, I meant to stand outside the fence each evening at six o'clock and whistle for her until the day she died. I felt so foolish, having gone so far as to compose bad poetry in my deception, that I was utterly beside myself, unable even to respond. You needn't worry. My sister, remarkably calm and composed, smiled an almost sublimely beautiful smile. You saw the letters I had tied in that green ribbon, didn't you? They... they weren't real. You see, I was so lonely that a year ago last fall, I began writing those letters and sending them to myself. Please don't think me foolish. Youth is an awfully precious thing. I've really come to understand that since I fell ill. I know that writing letters to yourself is a wretched thing to do. Perfectly vile and foolish. But I really wish I'd had a chance to do something bold and reckless with a gentleman friend. I would have liked someone to hold me tightly in his arms. Not only have I never had a lover, I've never even talked with a man, outside our immediate circle, I mean. You haven't either, have you? That was our mistake. We were too sensible. Ah, oh, 
I hate the thought of dying. My poor hands, my poor fingertips, my poor hair. I don't want to die. I don't. I was so sad and afraid and happy and ashamed, so full of emotions that I didn't know what I was feeling. And I put my arms around her and pressed her hollow cheek against my own, my eyes brimming with tears. And that's when I heard it. It was a faint, soft sound, but there was no mistaking it. Someone whistling the battleship march. My sister heard it too. She turned her head and listened. I took a look at the clock. And ah, it was just six. Overwhelmed by a nameless fear, we both sat perfectly still, hugging each other tightly as that uncanny tune continued from beyond the cherry trees in the garden. My sister died three days later. The end came so quietly and so suddenly that even the doctor seemed mystified. But I wasn't surprised. Everything, I believed, was according to God's will. Now, well now, I'm an old woman with all sorts of shameful, selfish desires. Perhaps my faith isn't as strong as it once was. I've come to wonder if that wasn't my father whistling. He might have returned early from school that day and been standing in the next room listening to us. Pity might have moved him to contrive that little deception. An impetuous act a strict and serious man like him might perform but once in a lifetime. That's what I think sometimes. But no, it's awfully hard to imagine. If father were still alive, I could ask him. But it's been some 15 years since he passed away. No, surely it was the work of God. At least, it would set my heart at ease to believe that. But as I've got older, I've come to have all these earthly desires. And I know it's a bad thing. But my faith just isn't as strong as it once was. Today's story, Cherry Leaves and the Whistler, was by Osame Dazai, translated by Ralph Elf McCarthy, and read by me, Yuko Aotani.